There's a church not very far from where my wife works and it has one of those church signs out in the front. And the other day I was driving by there and I noticed that its message currently reads, the way to God begins with a broken heart. And that reminded me of something that I had heard before. I, I have uh, some friends who have been in the military or are in the military. Uh, and they've talked to me about their, their boot camp experiences. I never joined the military myself. Uh, I, I am far too weak and cowardly and lacking in sufficient motivation uh, to have ever joined the military. But I've spoken to some friends of mine over, over the years, and they describe the boot camp experience in terms that reminded me of that church sign. They say that when you enter boot camp, when you enter basic training, the job of your trainer, of your sergeant, is to break you down as a person, to completely take you all the way down to zero, to strip you of your dignity and of your will, and then from that level foundation to build you back up into a soldier or a marine or a sailor or whatever you're going to be. And that sign, that church sign, reminded me of, of that process only without the building back up part. You see, this, this whole notion, and I'm not saying that every single Christian believes this or that every single Christian church teaches this as a doctrine, but there is definitely, especially in, in conservative evangelical Christianity, there's definitely this strain of thought that in order to truly be close to God, in order to truly attain enlightenment, you have to reach rock bottom. The road to God begins with a broken heart. You can't be happy and successful and fulfilled and truly know what it's like to be close to God because God doesn't want you when you're happy and successful and fulfilled. He wants you when you're broken down, when you have nothing left, when you're desperate. That's when you should turn to God. It's an idea that is not very far removed in its essence from the, the preachings of Jonathan Edwards over 200 years ago. Uh, we've all read or heard someone read that great maniacal sermon by Jonathan Edwards, the, the a sinner in the hands of an angry God, where he describes uh, humanity as a spider being dangled by a thread, by its own web over a cauldron and about to be dropped in. And the hand dangling the spider is the hand of God and he's dangling all of us over the pits of hell. And Jonathan Edwards describes God as hating us. We're all sinners and God hates us. And if we don't repent and if we don't accept Christ and become Christians, there's nothing that would give him more pleasure than to drop us all into that cauldron, to send us to hell, to burn and suffer in torment forever. Now, even most arch-conservative, ultra-conservative Christians today would not describe their, their, their God in those terms. They, even the angriest, most bitter conservative Christian wouldn't say that God hates us. Uh, they take actually the opposite view. They claim that God loves us. But there's still that idea that humanity is inherently worthless. Yeah, sure, okay, maybe Jonathan Edwards went a little too far. Maybe Jonathan Edwards was a little nuts. God doesn't hate us. God loves us. But he only loves us because of how good he is, because of his grace, because of his infinite mercy, which is what it takes to love us, because human beings ourselves, apart from God, are completely worthless. That's why we need God. That's why we need to, to be saved by God, because we're completely worthless. Because God created us, and he put us in this perfect world that he had made, and as soon as we got there, we fucked it all up. We disobeyed him, Eve ate that apple, Adam ate that apple, they listened to the snake instead of to God, and they just ruined everything for all of us. And now we live in this fallen world, this, this, sinful world that is of our own making, that is the, the, the dried up, rotted husk of the perfect world that God created for us originally. But even after that, God still loves us because just, that's just how good he is. And even when, when Christianity talks about the goodness of humanity or the, the potential for goodness in humanity, it's not from us. It's not anything innate in us. It's because we're made in the image of God. God made us in his image. And that's why 
we have this ability to to love and to forgive and to be compassionate and and to recognize the truth of God's existence. It makes me wonder, as I often wonder when I'm studying or, or otherwise confronted with some bizarre religious doctrine and being a a citizen of the United States having lived in Western Maryland for my entire life, usually that religion is Christianity. Why would anyone want to believe this? And in the complete absence of any evidence to believe this, because there's not a single reason to believe any of this. You can read the Bible from cover to cover and there's not a single reason to believe that any of it is anything more than mythology, is anything more than a cultural record of religious belief rather than a record of, of, of divine truth revealed and put down on paper by inspired agents of God. There's no reason to hear the story of Adam and Eve and to think that that is anything more than a fairy tale. So why do so many people believe it? What is appealing about it? Why would anyone want to believe this, to be told that they're completely worthless, except as they are valued by God? And then it hit me. I remembered, I was reminded, as I always am, oh, we're all scared shitless of dying. That's why people believe it. That, I think, is religion in a nutshell. It's a coping mechanism that has just gone horribly awry and been tolerated and allowed to endure for a couple 10,000 years and allowed to dominate every human culture that it's ever been introduced into because we just cannot reconcile ourselves to the fact that someday we're going to die and that's going to be it and there's nothing we can do about it. Unfortunately, that nothing we can do about it also includes making up lies to tell ourselves and our children about what's going to happen after we die. And most unfortunately, a lot of those lies, including the ones that tell us that we as human beings are inherently worthless apart from our imaginary God, actually, instead of making things better, make things a whole lot worse for a lot of people here among the living.